What's going on, YouTube? Last video, we talked about a gangster that was flashy. He had the cars, the jewelry, the clothes. Well, tonight, we're going to talk about somebody that didn't care about none of that. But he had more money than all those flashy dope boys. He was actually the plug of some big names. 112th Street Stand Up. My YouTube family, we've been rocking now for almost two years. Let's get into it. Now, being born in the South, similar to some other big names like Bumpy Johnson, Frank Matthews, and Frank Lucas, he would eventually move to NY where his father was a stick-up kid. He lost his life to the police. When his father was gone, he was next in line. He took on the role of the provider. Now, he picked up some gigs here and there for a little money, but his life would change when he met Queen B, a dealer out of Harlem. She had a product. He had the ability to get rid of it fast. Things was rocking for a while. He was able to stack some good funds. When working with Queen B, he began to have a better understanding of the game. He saw many things that he didn't agree with. He saw her flaws and how sloppy her business was. She stepped on the product so much that it became weak. Customers started to complain a lot. Giving competitors the opportunity to take customers, people took them as a joke as people began to set up shop in front of his shooting gallery on 15th Street. Before things would get out of hand, it was squashed by a mutual acquaintance. He eventually broke away from Queen B and got with the Italians at the height of the pizza connection, which was a scheme involving purchasing morphine based from suppliers in Turkey, processing it into ancient Sicily, bringing it into the U.S., and then selling it through pizza shops and other mafia businesses stretching from New York to Illinois and Wisconsin from January 1975 until April 1984. An estimated $1.6 billion worth of H was shipped to this country in the plot. He got his money up and developed good connections. I mean, with the resources, he could never go broke again. Eventually, good things come to an end. During a piece of connection takedown, he ducked those indictments like Floyd. He got away clean, but an attempt on his life took place by two gunmen shortly. He didn't know where the hit came from. He was rushed to the hospital and had a blood transfusion that saved his life. He went back to the south to recover and lay low because, just like I said, he didn't know where the hit came from. During recovery, it was very peaceful, but the money was getting low. When he healed, he had to return to New York to make some money. He took what he had in his stash, played numbers, hit different gambling spots till he gathered enough paper to make a deal. He didn't really drink or get high or anything. Now, his thing was gambling. Now, every gambler I know lose way more than they win. But that one win out of 100 will keep you coming back for more for some reason. You get a rush from almost winning. <laughs> but yeah, gambling will take a big chunk out of your net worth. Believe it or not, gambling will have the balls borrowing from his workers. But anyway, he met with an associate to the Medellin cartel. They gave him a deal that he couldn't turn down with 60 keys of white on consignment and will make 6K off each key. If you do the math, that's 360 grand. He didn't look back. It went from 60 to 500 blocks a month. He got locked in with the Medellin cartel. They wasn't just dealing with anybody. Fritz was something different. Plus, Griselda had the five barrels. Top of the line product, I tell you. His work was so good that a fiend took a hit and started crying. Yeah, that was that pure fish girl. Money was coming in like it was nothing. He looked out for everyone around him. He would ride around and hit every hood, passing out bricks with people's name on it. He was like Santa Claus. He was changing dudes' lives, giving them an opportunity to get rich. When a lot of guys didn't even have the money up front, he created bosses all over Harlem. Now, when Rich Porter first met him, he didn't even believe he was the man because of how raggedy he looked. He was low-key, under the radar, no flexing, didn't have to do too much. He wasn't just a part of the game, he quarterbacked it. During his entire run, he didn't do a day in jail. A lot of hustlers should have took some plays out of his book. But when you get money, it's very hard not to flex. Man, he was so low-key, a lot of hustlers that didn't even know they were standing right next to him. And once they found out later, man, they would go off. They expected someone flashy with a lot of gold on, you know, the designer wear, you know, the flashy cars, just larger than life. And he didn't mind helping people. He was a giver. See, I don't believe when they say money changes people. If you're a scumbag, the money makes you a bigger scumbag. If you're a giver, the money makes you more of a giver. And Fritz gave to everyone. He took care of everyone around him. Now, with the money comes leeches and extortion. At one point, the kidnappings were out of control in Harlem. Rich Porter, little brother, was kidnapped, and he helped Rich with 30 joints. Now, he understood because he had two failed kidnapping attempts on himself. And that 30 he gave Rich wasn't nothing. He was giving Hen Dog 60 on a regular. 
But you had guys like the wild cowboys that were dressed as cops and staged fake arrests to snatch victims. They would have badges and everything. Now the crew was full of blacks and whites. They would use the whites as the cops to pull the guys over. His right hand man fell victim, but never made it out. They even found where his baby mama stay, and they took some money from her. And they would see Fritz on the block and they would pass him a note just to let him know that they had to drop on his baby mom. But a year after those attempts, he began to feel sick with a bad cough. He had body aches, sore throat, mucus, and chills. He would pass out in public. Now, people didn't know what was going on, but they had to get him to the ER fast, where the doctor said he had pneumonia. Now, some people say it was poison. Some people said he had HIV from the blood transfusion when he got shot. I mean, if he had the HIV, I could see why they wouldn't even tell him after seeing the history of the blood transfusion from years ago to avoid a big fat lawsuit. Now, when he came back, he looked very tired, lost a lot of weight. His eyes had dark circles. He began giving away large amounts of money to anyone who acts like he knew his time was coming. He would wear big coats on hot summer days. When he became too weak to get out of bed, he instructed his in-law to deliver two boxes full of cash to his sisters, and they still didn't receive it yet. While laying in bed, it got to a point where he looked like a skeleton. When he went to the hospital, the doctors ran tests and couldn't find out what was killing him. It does sound like HIV to me, but you would think during a blood transfusion, multiple tests will be ran before the blood is being used, but... I don't know. Let me know in the comments what y'all think. August 16th, 1991, he passed away. His body was buried in South Carolina, even though his friends wanted him to be brought to New York for a funeral service. And, you know, of course, it cost money to transport the body, but you heard crickets when he asked. The sister buried him with the insurance policy she had on him. Now, it doesn't make any sense how his friends got a piece of his leftovers, but his family was left with nothing. You had people with the code to a safe that didn't even look out for the family at all. But hey, that's the game, I guess. But thanks for tuning in tonight. Show love. It costs nothing to hit that like button. Hit the comments. Y'all be safe out there and do what Fritz would say. Stack your money for a rainy day. I'm out.